Okay, so today is Palm Sunday. Um, <laughs> I've been, uh, I've been asking God to speak to me on this special day as we begin the the week, Passion Week, and uh, so I'm just sharing some things with the Lord ministered to me and I just trust that it will be of benefit to many of you here and uh, God spoke to me not only through my meditation I have a good friend who sends me messages short messages uh, so a lot of what I will be sharing is what I received through him shall we pray <coughs> Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this morning, this new day, uh, this year of revival, as Lord, you have given this word to our pastor during the beginning of this year, that this is a year of revival for us in the church. And Lord, as we think of this Palm Sunday, this Lord, as the whole world is meditating, especially all the churches all across the globe is concentrating in a special way on the way you send your son Jesus Christ coming as a man living among ordinary people the poorest of the poor but yet determined to suffer to go through the cross and Lord, bring salvation to all of us who trust in you. This is such a marvelous truth. Help us, Lord, not to take it as a daily thing and not to value it. But Lord, I pray even this morning as your word comes to us that it will touch our hearts and, and draw us to yourself, Lord, because it is your desire that we become more and more like Jesus. Nothing else is more important than this. So Lord, this morning as we think and meditate, read your word, Lord, let your word come alive to us. Each one of us, Lord, speak to our hearts and transform us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> You know, there are two verses that even I and almost all of us quote very often. That is Jeremiah 29, 11. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will answer you. It's such a good thing, good promise. Another thing is Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them that love God. But it ends by saying that we may be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So that is the final thing. And when we think of revival, I always like to think of the end result. So the end result of revival, it may begin with many things, but the end result for me in my life is to be more like Jesus. Now, after the last two weeks ago, there was a prayer here and, and I have a new responsibility. But as I stand here, don't look at me any differently, whether I become sonal pastor or bishop or whatever it is, ultimately in heaven, who am I? I am a sinner saved by the grace of God. And it will always remain the same. So for God, when he looks at me, these things are not important. Those are responsibilities given to us. But when I stand before God, he will look at me and measure me, not by my position, not the honor that people may give to me, but measure me with the life of Christ. How much I am conformed to his 
image. So let's look at uh, Luke chapter 19. Uh, this is the, the Luke's, Dr. Luke's description of what happened on the Palm Sunday. The triumphal entry. Luke chapter 19, verse 28 to 45. It's a long portion. But this portion can be divided into three sections. 28 to 40 is the first section. And maybe I will uh, read it. And if you have your, the, your Bibles with you, follow it along with me. I will be reading from the NIV. And it says, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Tell him, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead, went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their clo cloaks on the, clo on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, the people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Now here is Jesus. He knows everything that's going to happen in the next few days. And as you know, Jesus came into this world with this one purpose. He was born as the Savior. He was born as the King. But all through his life, as he started the ministry, with all the miracles happening, with all the wonderful things he taught and he preached, his face was always set to go to Jerusalem and finally fulfill the commission with which he came to this earth. When you look at the few ten chapters before this, Luke chapter 9 onwards, we see Jesus telling the disciples why he had come for. In the midst of all the things, even when Peter proclaimed that to Jesus, finally among all the people, that you are the Messiah. Then Jesus told that he has to go to Jerusalem. He will be beaten up. He will be crucified. But yet he will rise again. And many times along the way, we see Jesus telling the disciples, this is where I'm going. And it says in some portions, it says that they were amazed. Why he's going to Jerusalem? But his eyes, his face was, was set on this purposeful trip to Jerusalem. And now he's coming near and near and near to the day and near and near to Jerusalem, to the cross. And here it says, Jesus said to the disciples, go to the village to untie this one colt tied there on whom no one has ever ridden. It is a young donkey 
upon whom nobody has ever ridden. And as I think of the young people here, yesterday pastor sent me a message, 28 of them in this church. You are very precious. You are very powerful. 28 of you is not just to sit in the church and worship. It is great. But God can do great things through you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So here is this one called on whom Jesus is going to ride on. And uh, in the question is asked when they untie, it is asked, if anyone asks you why are you untying it, tell them only one thing. The Lord needs it. Not only the youth, the Lord needs you and me. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing for you and me to give my life to Jesus in a fresh way, in a new way as we begin enter into this week of meditating on the cross. The Lord needs it. Hallelujah. It is not for anybody else. It is not for my family, not for my relatives, not even for New Life Fellowship, not for anything else. The Lord needs it. Hallelujah. The Lord needs you. The revival will come. When I am, I know that I am for my Lord who needs me. So the journey begins this way. And then we see those who were sent ahead, they saw exactly like that. And they gave the same reply, the Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus. They brought this called inexperience. Nobody has ever ridden, not even trained to be ridden by anybody. And then it says, Jesus, everybody then, they brought to Jesus, they threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. They brought to Jesus. What a beautiful thing to bring to Jesus. You know, we are all called to bring others to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Such a joy when you can bring one person to Jesus. The youth, as you go out and as you interact with people, the adults in our workplaces, what a joy to be able to bring to Jesus. Hallelujah. So may God give us opportunities during this week and as we go on, even as we are looking to a revival in this church, may God give me and give you all of us the grace to bring someone to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then it says they brought to Jesus as he, and then he sits on this and he comes riding into Jerusalem on the colt, on a donkey. You know, this portion describes one special character of Jesus. And I want us to meditate on that. That is the meekness and the humility of this King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It is a theme that is very important. Even when it was prophesied about Jesus' coming in, uh, in Zechariah chapter 9, the prophet says, Rejoice greatly. Chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fall of a donkey. This king, the king of kings and the lord of lords, who established all the kingdoms and all the kings. Every authority is made by him. 
But as he comes to Jerusalem, the city of God, he comes riding on a donkey. Simple, humble, meek. You know, the kings of this earth comes riding on horses and chariots. Here is this king of kings coming, riding on a donkey. This king is so different. The kings of this world, when they come, they destroy their enemies. You see the fighting that's happening across the globe. Everyone wants to destroy their enemy. Some destroy the enemies who attack them, but some even presumptive enemies, they want to destroy them. But our king dies for his enemies. Hallelujah. We are, you and I are called to follow him. So it is a totally different, absolutely different life that he is calling us and the kingdom life into which he is calling us. You know, in this world, the kings have their so many servants doing everything for them, washing their feet, everything. Here, this servant king of kings washes the feet of his servants. Hallelujah. That is what you and I are called to. And this king comes riding because he is meek. And that is something which I desire in my own life. That is why I'm sharing this. What do I desire in this season in my life? That I may have the meekness and the humility of Jesus Christ. It is something which I can pretend, but I need to have it deep down. Sometimes we can pretend to be humble. But God looks inside the heart and he sees the heart. In Psalm 45, verse 2, it says, You are the most excellent. This is again a prophetic psalm about Jesus Christ. You are the most excellent of men, and your lips have been anointed with grace since God has blessed you forever. In your majesty, ride forth victoriously in behalf of truth, humility, and righteousness. Truth, humility, and righteousness. I, was, I love this thing. You know, this of talking about Jesus, the excellent of men. Your lips have been anointed with grace. Grace is such a beautiful thing. And that is connected with humility. Just before I came, this, just as I arrived here, there was a message in my phone about one person sending a message to somebody else. And that message was a little harsh. And I came and I sat here and then I was wondering, God, should I do anything about it? But in the middle of the service, I felt I should just communicate to this person. It was a bit, you could be grace, more gracious in this. You know, the lips of Jesus, if I have to have the lips of Jesus, if I am a follower of Jesus, my lips should speak the words that are gracious. When God looks from heaven, that is the most beautiful thing. In this world, we may be able to get things done by authority and power, and maybe when we get excited, we want things to be done. We lose that grace. And Jesus, this morning, as he rides to Jerusalem, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, reminding us, his children, in this church, whether young or old, let us be gracious in our communication with each other. Whether it be in our families, whether it be in our workplaces, then we will be lifting up Christ. You know, the world is looking for gracious people. They know that Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. When they think of Jesus, they look of somebody 
who is forgiving, compassionate. They know it. But when they look at the church, when they look at us as Christians, do they see that? If they don't see that, then we have let him down. I can be preaching and standing here. I can be doing so many things. But the but Jesus said, if, if you cause one of these little ones to fall, it is better for that person to hang a stone around his neck and drown in the river. So it is a very important thing. As we walk and as we live in this life, we should not be the cause of, for anyone to trip and fall. Because when they look at me as a Christian, if they don't see grace in me, then that is dishonoring him. Matthew eleven twenty nine, Jesus said, 28 and 29, Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. What do you learn from me? I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest to your souls. I am, so, I am a follower of Jesus. We all are. And so we are expected to be humble in heart where people can find rest. If I am with Jesus, when people come to me, they should find rest in my presence. They should find rest in my conversations, in my interaction. Sometimes it is possible for me to be very careful outside. But sometimes we are not so careful with our brothers and our sisters. We take them for granted humble and let them find rest with us. It's true in our homes, in our families, with our husbands and wives, we take them for granted. And the humility goes and they don't find rest in our interactions. So we may we be careful in our life as we follow this king, this savior, who is coming riding on a donkey. Jesus knew, it says, in, 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 uh, he's coming down the Mount of Olives to go to Jerusalem. And as he came down, he went down and down and down all through this week, finally down onto the cross to, the, to be humiliated, to be spat upon. And then on the cross, when even while on the cross, one person on the cross is again laughing at him. People are shouting at him. Others are saying, you come down if you are the... Such humiliation. He's our king. How do I react when somebody accuses me or somebody humiliates me or when I overhear somebody speaking evil of me? That is the time when I am tested. My testing is not with my sickness and suffering and all. My testing is how I react. When God in heaven is looking, put a situation around me, how do I re react? How do I respond? Philippians chapter 2 describes how I should be the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. It says, verse 2, Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Oh God, help me. Your attitude should be the same 
as that of Christ Jesus. It's not possible with our human effort, but again, I cry unto God, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will answer you. So I need his help. It says, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. This mind is what I am supposed to have. I am supposed to grow in it. Now, as far as I can see, com compared to all of you here, I am the oldest in I think 54 years, anybody here who has known the Lord 54 years or more, can I have a hands please? No. 1970 onwards, the Lord has been gracious to me. So I am expected. So I should be more like Jesus than any one of you. So I can't look at anybody of you and say that, oh, you are not like Jesus. You should be more like Christ. I'm the one who should set an example to have the mind of Christ. And it says, Meekness, the further description of it is mild. Our nature, our behavior will be mild in nature, gentle, quiet. In English dictionary it says a meek person is a submissive person. We submit to one another. A meek husband will submit to his wife and a meek wife will submit to her husband. If I have to see meekness, how I work in my office to the people above me. If it's in the church, how I am submissive to those whom God has placed above me. Lowly. Jesus is mentioned, somebody who was lowly. And of course in Isaiah 53 it describes the prophetically what Jesus would do, he opened not his mouth. When all the, even he went through seven trials on that night and that morning, everywhere, so many accusations against him, he opened not his mouth. That is humility, that is meekness. We always have to justify ourselves. Even if when my wife says something to me, I think if it is not, uh, I have to immediately jump up and justify. But that's not, that's not what, as I grow, that's not what God expects from me. So in this season, as Paul said, I delight in my weakness. Second Corinthians 12, 10. In insults, in hardships, persecutions, difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Hallelujah. So this is the first portion. We'll go a little fast now. And the second portion is talking about another aspect of Christ. Sorry. Luke chapter 19, verse 41, not verse 40, 41 to 44. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, if you 
even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace but now it is hidden from your eyes the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side they will dash you to the ground you and the children within your walls they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of god's coming to you jesus is coming down mount of olives as he is coming down he is seeing the city of jerusalem and as he sees the city even though there are so many people praising him and all the children are rejoicing and all the people are happy and he is riding on the horse as coming as the king as promised as he looks at jerusalem and maybe the hundreds of thousands of people living in those houses he weeps over the city i am told that this weeping is different from the tears that he shed at the tomb of lazarus which happened probably just a few days before there it says jesus cry jesus wept in some other languages is jesus shed his tears but here it is weeping wept it is a loud weeping when people are praising and singing and dancing here is this man of sorrows jesus whom i follow weeping over the city of jerusalem the beautiful city because the people in the city were lost to eternity there is another instance when jesus talks in luke um when jesus is talking about this city again the same city uh, in matthew 23 27 and luke 13 it takes oh jerusalem jerusalem jesus talks about the city how i long to have you just like a hen would have a chick and chicks under her wings how i long to protect you how i long to cover you but you will not and in this portion jesus is talking the people in the city cannot hear but the people along with him and can hear and he says if you even you and then he says personally to the city you know it says you even you had only known this day what would bring you peace but now it is hidden from your eyes the days will come upon you when your enemy your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side personally jesus is talking to you to me not to the person sitting next not to the pastor not to anybody else not to the elder to you when was the last time i pray that god would give me the heart so that i can weep over the people who don't know you susan just mentioned something but if a revival has to come then tears have to flow i can't create it but let's pray that the holy spirit will do give us on this palm sunday as we look towards meditating on the cross that we will have the tears and to cry for cities and for nations and for people groups and our neighbors and our friends oh god help me that i will have this that i will grow in this i will mature in this that i will be god can use me with wailing and tears to pray for those who are lost to eternity and then finally and this is a jesus was crying because of compassion because of the love that he had for the city we know how god had loved the city of nineveh 
people, so wicked people. But God still loved them. And he sent his prophet who refused to go. He caught him and brought him back so that that city could repent. May God give us understanding of his heart, how he longs to see the salvation to come. And then we come to the last portion, that is verse 45 to 48. It says, then he entered the temple. Now Jesus has come. He has come to the city of Jerusalem, walked through the streets. Finally, he has entered the temple. Then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. And it is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the leaders among them were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. All the people hung on his words. Are we all people who are today hung on the words of Jesus? But here in this portion, let me, talk, let me concentrate on this one, another special character of Jesus. The zeal for God. The zeal for the house of the Lord. Initially we saw his humility, his meekness. Then we saw his compassion and his love tearing up his heart as he saw the, saw the eternal lostness of his people and then here we see his zeal for God's purposes and his plans. The zeal for the house of God was burning within him. We see this again, we see this before this in, uh, in John chapter 2, we see um, 17, we see Jesus in the initial first visit to Jerusalem in the early days of his ministry. And there he comes and he sees all these things and then he chases people out. And then he says in chapter 2 verse 17 of John's Gospel, Get these out of here, he said. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? How I long for that zeal. Even as I'm meek and humble, even as I cry out in tears, as the Spirit of God convicts me of the knee of the lost eternity of my friends and my neighbors, but let me arise with the zeal of God, that the zeal of my father turn from off for my father's house will consume me. Psalm 69, verse 9 is again a prophetic psalm. It says about the zeal for my house will consume me. He couldn't stay watching these things happen. He had to take action. Jesus was full of zeal. Even though he was a man of sorrows, he did exactly what the Father was doing. He saw and he didn't waste a time. In John chapter 4, verse 34, he says, My food, my food Jesus is said is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. There is no time to waste. We must work with zeal to finish the work that he has given each one of us. And in John chapter 9 verse 4 he says, as long as it is the day we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Night is coming when no one can work. As it is the day, we have time and there is need for us to get into action and work with zeal of the Lord by the Holy Spirit helping us. You know, that is what Paul said in, in, Matthew, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6. Paul says, about all that he was. He had so many credentials over him. 
but he said i consider them as rubbish for the excellency of knowing christ jesus my lord hallelujah all our credentials doctor cardiologist so you know whatever be your credentials are nothing but let us leave them all aside but let's be available to jesus so three things as we come to this uh, palm sunday check our lives and see and desire and long and pray that we will grow in the in these three characteristics of jesus as it was shown on this palm sunday his humility his lowliness his meekness full of grace yet full of truth and then his love his compassion his heart that goes out to the lost weeping wailing aloud loud cries it says in hebrews this is one of the instances of a loud cries uncontrollable and then may we have the zeal for the lord let us not lose the first love and as i was meditating on this the lord reminded me how i had zeal for the lord and as in my younger days i remember there was a film show in our college uh, it was a billy graham movie about about the conversion of a young man in new york and as the movie was running the power went off halfway through and it was coming to that that exciting moment and i was sitting there i was feeling so sad i was a young medical student third year medical student and there were seniors there were my seniors other people so many people in the hall and we were wait praying for the power to come but the power was not coming and then the chaplain said you know i'm sorry we will have to we will close the session and maybe we'll have it in another time and the zeal of the lord i just caught up on that there is no power i caught up and then i preached i said you know what was going to happen the zeal and when when i went to the hostel one of my senior you know told me jason you should never have done that you know i said it is the zeal of the lord where is that zeal for the lord i cry for oh god in these days lord give us that zeal for you shall we stand in god's presence we'll sing that song meekness and majesty it's a song written by graham kendrick hallelujah meekness and majesty manhood and deity in perfect harmony the man who is god lord of eternity dwells in humanity kneels in humility and washes our feet oh what a mystery meekness and majesty bow down and worship for this is your god this is your god father's pure radiance perfect in innocence yet learn so beauteous to death on a cross suffering to give us life conquering through sacrifice and as they crucify praise father forgive oh what a mystery 
Meekness and majesty Bow down and worship For this is your God This is your God Wisdom unsearchable God the invisible how indestructible and frailty appears Lord of infinity, stooping so tenderly Lifts our humanity to the heights of His throne Oh, what a mystery, meekness and majesty Bow down and worship this is your God This is your God This is your God We submit ourselves to the word that has come to us This is our God In meekness and humility rides in a cold towards Jerusalem knowing the fact that he is going to be crucified did not stop he led the disciples ahead of them in joy endured the cross endured the suffering and pain that was supposed to be us sinless perfection Yet, the word says he did not sin. He stood there as a lamb to be slaughtered. The sin of this world was put on his head. Died the death of a criminal. Hung on a tree, cursed was he called. Yet, did not sin. Raised on the third day, restored the brethren, stood with them, walked with them, mate with them, and taken away in the midst, from the midst of them towards the heavens, promising us that he will come back. He will make every wrong right. With justice, he will prevail. The King of Kings who sat on a colt coming back as the king of kings and the ruler of this world with the sound of the trumpets with the archangels shouting and the angels crying holy, holy, holy is the Lord Maranatha come Lord Jesus come Lord Jesus thank you Lord for your for incredible majesty which is coated with meekness and humility we pray that you may help each one of us if there's anybody here going through a tough time Lord I pray that tonight will be the day of revival this month will be the day of healing a day of restoration a breakthrough the day of joy we give you glory and honor in Jesus most precious name we pray Amen, Amen, and Amen. Can we just lift up our hands and go with the benediction? Now may the love of God, grace and mercy of Jesus, sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, enable each one of us as we model this great God in meekness and majesty. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and Amen. Put our hands together for the Lord.